Hello, my name is Patricia Collard. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of East London and I teach psychotherapy and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. In this lecture today we are going to learn a little bit more about mindfulness. Mindfulness as it is used in stress reduction clinics or also as cognitive therapy or last but not least as prevention from illness and disease. So I hope you're going to enjoy this lecture. Don't change your life, experience your life. Don't change yourself, be yourself. In this short quotation, John Kabat-Zinn actually said everything we need to know about mindfulness. Mindfulness means being in the present moment on purpose and without judgment. Bringing childlike curiosity to what life is presenting us at this moment. So why do we need to learn something that seems so blatantly obvious? Perhaps it has something to do with the fact that we have diverted a lot from our original way of life. For hundreds and thousands of years people lived in nature and with nature and had a lifestyle that was adapted to the seasons, to day and night. And if you remember when you were a little child, you probably were mindful anyhow. Because for children it's very, very difficult to understand what time actually means. It's very difficult for children to learn the clock, the time, what an hour means. Children live in the moment and as we were all children at some point we were mindful at some point. We actually enjoyed just lying in the grass, just feeling the grass tickle our toes looking into the sky and counting the clouds or seeing imaginary figures in the clouds and things like that. So being mindful is actually our truest state of awareness. Nothing to achieve, nowhere to get to, simply being alive. And the interesting thing is that in English actually we call ourselves human beings rather than human doings, but the way our life has um, changed in the last hundred years is really very different to how we were primed and what our instincts tell us. When we look at research in anthropology, there are still some people in the Amazon, in Papua New Guinea, I visited them, that live in the original lifestyle. And the maximum number of hours where they're actually active is about four hours a day. So yes, they have to find food and repair their homes, but otherwise, although they look older, they are very much like children. They sit together, they sing together, they stare into the sky, they simply live. And they don't feel guilty by not doing anything. So why are you being introduced to mindfulness on this course? Well, let's just look at the development of mindfulness within medicine and psychotherapy. It was about 31 years ago that a molecular biologist named John Kabat-Zinn in Massachusetts, US, actually had an inspiration while he was meditating. He was on a retreat and during his meditation he had the insight that he would like to bring some of the messages he was learning at this meditation retreat into the hospital. Into the hospital where he was working, not as a doctor, not as a therapist, but I suppose in the lab. So he wanted to teach people how to live their life how to really experience their life and not just live around 
the illness they had been diagnosed with. So he designed the stress reduction program that it was called then and it was based on a number of different sources. It was based on Buddhist meditation, on yoga, Taoism, Eastern philosophy, but also what you would find in the tradition of the mystics in Western spirituality. But he wanted to take it out of the spiritual context and bring it into daily life. In this sense, in this particular case, into the daily life of people who were seriously ill. So he started working initially with chronic pain patients. These were people who had been treated with any medication and every medication that was available. And the doctors had to say, we can't help them anymore. We can keep them alive, but they just have to learn to deal with their pain. And what had happened to many of the participants of his first few courses were that they basically started to live around their pain so much that the rest of their life had no purpose anymore. All they wanted is to get rid of the pain. And what John managed to teach them is actually, if you don't focus on the pain all the time, if you focus on, for example, a lovely flower that you might see, or a juicy apple you are eating, or on the sunset or sunrise, then for this period of time you will actually not think about the pain. And you might have something like a life. An interesting thing is in about 1987-88 there was a television program so John had been running his course for you know a good eight nine years and in this television program his course was actually introduced to the American audience all over the United States and uh, you know as soon as the program had finished thousands of people rang Massachusetts hospital clinic where John was working and wanted to either participate in an MBSR mindfulness based stress reduction course or they wanted to learn how to run these courses. So this is where it all started. Something that an individual designed for a very individual place and then it suddenly started to have a ripple effect and spread and now there are over 50 hospitals in the United States where the stress reduction clinics are run, where people do an eight-week mindfulness-based stress reduction course. So that's really interesting. And now, nowadays, people are very much a mixed population when they enter these courses. They might have chronic pain. They might suffer from other illnesses. They might suffer from psychological illnesses like anxiety or depression or anger and in the last few years we've actually seen a real wave of mindfulness take over not only the United States of America but also Europe in Germany in the United Kingdom in Holland and in Scandinavia many people are now using mindfulness interventions not only in hospitals but also within the setting of psychotherapy. Actually, the NICE guidelines recommended a couple of years ago that mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which was a follow-on development from mindfulness-based stress reduction, is warmly recommended to prevent relapse of depression. So now we have entered an era where mindfulness is used within psychological services to help people lead a better life and to help people not to relapse into depression. The mindfulness-based cognitive therapy program was developed by a number of psychologists, Mark Williams, John Teasdale and Single Seagar and, sorry, can I do that again? Yeah. Mark Williams, John Teasdale and Sindel Seagull 
And they wrote a book which was published in 2001 called Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy for Depression. Because they found that particularly with patients that had recurrent depression, so more than two or three episodes in their life, this mindfulness program was extremely helpful. Now, in the meantime, that was 2001, the second edition is due next year in 2012, and in the meantime, the NICE guidelines and also the Department of Health actually recommend mindfulness interventions for a whole array of psychological problems. Anxiety, depression, anger, obsessive compulsive disorder, trauma, eating disorder, addiction, basically almost for everything. They even now do research into whether we can reduce suicidality, the idea of committing suicide through mindfulness interventions. It's a five-year program that will finish next year and then we'll see the outcome. And even in the health services that deal with psychosis, very difficult to treat uh, psychological disease, people actually are now beginning to use mindfulness interventions. Since 2001 there have been at least 10 or more thousand papers published and these are research papers that are based on very serious research with control studies and they write about the different areas where mindfulness based interventions have been successful. But another reason why we're talking about mindfulness today is that mindfulness is also something that helps us to actually prevent getting sick. John kabat and his wife, for example, have written a book on mindful parenting. Mindfulness is now taken into businesses and companies to help people prevent breaking down, having stress-related illnesses and such like. So mindfulness, really, it is a condition that we all used to be very comfortable with and familiar with. And now we need to, unfortunately, go back and teach people how to be it rather than how to do it. So maybe you now want to know a little bit about how mindfulness works and how it is taught. So I think this is the right moment to just do a very brief meditation. And if you feel happy to do so, Gently sit upright in your chair in a dignified posture and if that feels comfortable, gently close your eyes. And I invite you to put one of your hands on your belly because this practice will be a breathing meditation. So I invite you first of all to feel your feet firmly on the ground, your sitting bones on the chair, your hands in your lap and maybe one hand on your belly. And because the mind is so busy and often wanders off, we need to give the mind an anchor of awareness. And for this practice the anchor of awareness is the breath. Now, how do we breathe? It's a very natural thing to do. Everybody knows how to breathe. You do it all the time. So in this particular practice, we don't change our breathing in any way, but we bring awareness to it. Focused, curious awareness. Breathing in, Noticing how on the in-breath your chest and your belly rise. Breathing out, noticing how the chest and belly deflate. Just that. 
The invitation is to just keep breathing naturally, not to direct your breath in any way or change it, not make it deeper or longer, but simply allow your body to breathe itself, bringing gentle curiosity to the process. So breathing in and breathing out. Just keeping to the breath as your anchor of awareness. You may notice that your mind wanders off into thinking, planning, maybe even thoughts of boredom. That's perfectly natural. So I invite you to escort your mind back to the awareness of breathing. And if you have to bring it back a hundred times, so be it. Just bring it back and breathe. Feeling your in-breath entering your nostrils, traveling down your windpipe and expanding your chest and your belly and deflating on the out-breath. You may even notice that the breaths that you breathe are of different lengths and that's perfectly natural. You may also notice that there is a little stop, a little break after each in-breath and after each out-breath. So all the while focusing on your breathing, only that, just being here, just now, where your life is actually happening, in this moment. So bringing this practice slowly to an end, Feeling your feet again firmly on the ground, your sitting bones on the chair and gently opening your eyes. And perhaps now you can just feel for yourself a little bit whether this practice has changed anything. Some people will say that they feel a little bit tired. Some people might feel a little bit more settled or calmer. And some people will say, I don't feel any different at all. And that's also okay. So when we practice mindfulness, we don't have a particular goal. The only goal there is, is simply to be and to allow life to unfold, to be curious about that, just as it was when we were children. Now, perhaps you want to know a little bit more about the eight-week program that I've mentioned a few times and also other ways of learning more about mindfulness. So the traditional eight-week course is run over eight weeks. Each session is about two to two and a half hours long and one or two teachers uh, actually teach you about mindfulness, about being aware in the present moment. There are a number of different practices. They also teach you about thoughts, that's particularly in the MBCT program in the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, about thoughts and how thoughts may be true but may very often not be true, just figments of your imagination or some old habits that you got into. So for example when we work with people who have obsessive thinking patterns, we really teach them that the thoughts might be there, but they're not necessarily the truth. We've all been there before, haven't we? 
So we are waiting for a friend, and the friend is late and doesn't call. So we're waiting in this coffee house, looking at our mobile, and the friend doesn't get in touch. And it's about 20 minutes late, 30 minutes late. And many people would by now have certain thoughts going around their head, like the thought, oh, he doesn't care about me, or she doesn't care about me. Or another thought, I must have done something wrong, that's why he, she isn't coming. Or another thought, oh my God, I hope he or she hasn't been involved in an accident. And maybe all that has happened is that an underground train got stuck between stations because of signal failure. We've heard that one many times. So we make people aware that the thoughts that they produce in their brain are not necessarily the absolute truth or the whole truth. So we learn different meditative techniques, but we also learn how to sort of look at our thoughts with a little bit more distance, almost like an observer. And that's done over eight weeks. In the first four weeks, you mainly learn the meditative practices. And in the second half, you learn more how to apply them in everyday life and how to look at thoughts in a different way. The most commonly taught practices in the eight-week program are the breath meditation that we've just done ourselves, a listening and viewing meditation, then the body scan, where you scan your whole body from toe to head, from down upwards. That's a very long practice. And then there are also practices called mindful walking, where you actually bring mindfulness into movement. Then there is mindful movement, which could be based on yoga, qigong, tai chi, pilates, any slow movement practice. And then there are also meditations where you actually look at your thoughts as if your thoughts were being shown in a slideshow. So you see your thoughts for what they are, just hiccups in the brain, I sometimes call them. So you see your thoughts, you look at them, but you don't necessarily connect with them or act upon them. So you learn to distance yourself a little bit from your thinking, and that has been particularly helpful with preventing relapse of depression, but with many other areas as well. And also, as I said, preventative. So after the eight-week course, usually people continue practicing, because the eight-week course is really just there to start you off, just like your parents teaching you how to brush your teeth. So once you know how to brush your teeth, you continue to brush them. Yeah, And with mindfulness, it's very similar. Once you know some of the practices, you continue to practice them. And we know from research that people who have done the whole course and benefited from it usually continue some form of mindfulness. At least about 70-80% of participants continue some form of mindfulness for the rest of their life. And then there is everyday mindfulness. That means bringing awareness to what you're doing. So let me show you what I mean. So for example here, I've got a little cup, a white cup of water. When I'm holding it, I notice that it's quite light, but also very cool. When I put it against my cheek, I notice that this is really refreshing, because today is a very hot, humid day, and it feels really comfortable to do that. And now I'm going to take a sip of water and then tell you how, whether I liked it and how it tasted. Mmm, delicious. Water tastes even better when it is hot and when you're thirsty. So I've just brought mindfulness to the activity of drinking. It doesn't need to take more than a few seconds or a minute or two, and you can actually bring mindfulness into everything you do. When you walk, just walk. When you eat, just eat. When you listen to music, just listen to music. What you might want to try doing today is to actually have a mindful shower. It's quite an experience. Often when people take a shower, they actually start doing their to-do lists, or they go through the day, the things that went wrong usually. But this time I'm inviting you to have a mindful shower and really have a shower. So really feel 
the temperature of the water. Really notice how you're putting soap or something else on your, some washing gel on your, on your body and how that feels, how it smells. Noticing how the water rinses it off, noticing the bubbles and how they are washed away. And notice even when you get out of the shower how you rub yourself dry and how you feel after having had the shower. And it will be a very different experience from other showers that you've taken in the past. At least that's what I noticed when I started to have mindful showers. So mindfulness can be brought into any and every activity. Even when you're driving your car and you get stuck in traffic, you can mindfully notice how you feel. You might feel upset, hot, tired, and even that we take on board. We just accept it for what it is and we know that it will pass. This too will pass. So um, it doesn't matter if some experiences in life are not so glorious, not so wonderful, because that's part of life. Yin and Yang. There's the dualism of life. And that's very much something that mindfulness tries to teach or make people aware of. Life has different experiences and it's very important to just roll with them and not to get particularly aversive to the ones that we don't like or particularly attached to the ones that we like because aversion and attachment both cause more suffering, more destructive emotions. So mindfulness really tries to help you to become more aware of everything that happens and in that way, and only in that way, it reduces suffering and unwellness. So now, having a little bit of an idea what mindfulness is, I will tell you a little bit about how mindfulness actually affects your awareness and your sense of being when you practice it. It's really something that very slowly gets into your system and then um, a neuropsychologist might say, you know, you grow new neuropathways in your brain, new ways of thinking, new ways of perceiving. Yeah, but that takes time. But it is possible as long as you breathe, as long as you're alive. So which attitudes are fostered and encouraged through the practice of mindfulness. First of all, you learn how to be a little bit more distant from the thoughts that might be upsetting you. And you just see them as thoughts and not necessarily reality. Secondly, you also learn patience. You learn that some things take longer, some things stay shorter, but life has its own time and you just learn to accept it. So acceptance is another attitude that is encouraged and nourished through the practice of mindfulness. Also childlike curiosity, really wanting to be like a child and looking for the adventure of life. Life, you know, it's a very brief period that we are on this planet and that we are actually alive. So let's savor every moment because it is important. It's almost miraculous some of the things that we experience. The other thing that we nourish through the practice of mindfulness is non-judgment. I mean usually we are quite judgmental. We judge other people but worst of all we judge ourselves. That doesn't mean that we don't look at certain activities as being harmful and therefore to be avoided. But we stop that constant judgment that creates guilt and negative emotions. We just see this was a wrong thing to do and I hope I learn from it and won't do it again. So we might sort of observe a deed as unhealthy or unhelpful but not judge the whole person. So these are the the ways of being that actually start growing within when you practice mindfulness. 
So perhaps the last thing you need to know, how can you actually learn more about mindfulness? I mean, there are hundreds of publications, not just the research papers that might be interesting for some of you, but not for all of you. But there are lots of wonderful books that you can get on mindfulness. And also, recently, the Department of Health has actually uh, started a new web page, which is called Be Mindful. So all you need to do is Google Be Mindful, and then this web page will show you people and how they experienced mindfulness and how it helped them in their life. You can also uh, see some teachers and trainers talk about mindfulness and, which is perhaps most important, you can actually find courses. Courses are now being run in the whole of the United Kingdom and in other countries. And if you're interested, you can even do one online, a very cost-effective one, but if you prefer to experience it with a group, which I warmly recommend because in the group experience we learn a lot more, uh, then you can actually see where, co where courses are run and you can book yourself onto one of these courses. So I'm very passionate about mindfulness because it really has changed my life and therefore I hope you will give it a try. Thank you.